and welcome to the TELC webinar series. I'm Kiran Pingali, CEO of TELC Group. A brief introduction about TELC, we are a fintech startup with a mission of bringing transparency on research, data, and analytics. We are a champion of independent research providers like Gary. We believe that bringing high quality, unbiased, and unconflicted research to the community is a privilege and a responsibility. Today, I'm extremely excited to have Gary Broad with me, Managing Partner at Deep Knowledge Investing. Gary, welcome to the Talk Webinar Series. Kieran, thanks for having me. At Deep Knowledge Investing, we help portfolio managers, hedge fund managers, family offices, and high net worth individuals get better returns in the equity portion of their portfolios. The reason above all that we love working with you and with Telk is because we think independent research providers have no conflicts. We aren't working with the companies that we cover. As a result, uh, we think our work is better quality and trustworthy, and uh, we're only focused on helping our clients get better returns. And I know that's in alignment with Telk's goals. That's why we're thrilled to be working with you. Thanks for having me today. Thank you, Gary. You can appreciate it. So today, Gary shares with you a fantastic new investment idea in the educational technology space, also known as EdTech. Gary has put out a fast, fascinating new piece on that topic. We will go top down and cover five broad areas from that piece. First, Gary, you mentioned that higher education is experiencing a crisis in the US and student debt is around $1.7 trillion. Why is that a crisis? what we should know about it and why we should care about it. So great question, Kieran. And that is at the core of why we're focused on the online education space. So let's talk about it. The headline number is, is frightening, $1.7 trillion. It's more than credit card debt in the United States. And in particular, that debt is concentrated among a lot of very young people who aren't in a position to pay it back. Um, this issue has risen to the level where you can't run for president in the United States without talking about what's going to be done to make education more affordable or whether we should be forgiving student loan debt uh, or how people can pay it back. Now, one of the great things about being out in public with research like we are is you become a clearinghouse for information. And over the last couple of weeks, We've had a ton of people contacting us wanting to share their view and their experience. And one of the best responses we got was from Bob Scott, the president emeritus of Adelphi University, who sent a four page letter talking about all of this. And one of the things that Bob pointed out, which we agree with, is that the 1.7 billion, sorry, trillion dollar number, um, it's headline grabbing, right? It's, it's salacious. It's just this enormous unpayable number. And what Bob pointed out is that for most people, a traditional education and taking on some student debt for that absolutely works. It's a workable plan. But there are a lot of other people who aren't matching their debt load with the university that they're going to and their degree. And so we have more and more people in situations where they graduate and they might be fifty, $100,000, $200,000 in debt, but have a degree that doesn't enable them to get a job where paying off that debt is possible. And so here are these people at 22, 23 years of age, and they're effectively debt servants for the rest of their lives. And that's the key issue. The issue is that we need to be matching the cost of education with the employment benefits that would come at the end of that education. And for a lot of people, there's a mismatch right now. Got it. Thank you. That's very helpful. And how are ed tech companies and spe specifically online education a solution to this huge problem that you just mentioned? I would focus on maybe three different things to re respond to that question. The first is that Coursera in particular specializes in offering degrees at a great discount to what it would cost you to live on campus. So the great example that we talked about in the piece that we released a couple of weeks ago um, is the University of Illinois took their MBA program from in-person to online only. And the cost of that degree went from $65,000 to I think $21,000, $22,000. So education is becoming much more affordable. Um, and that's, that's a key element of it. And also remember that when you're learning online, you can live at home. You don't have to be 
on a college campus. It enables people to maybe take care of aging parents, to take care of children, to work, all kinds of things like that. But the lower cost is key. The second thing we'd focus on is the fact that distance learning means that learning is accessible to people all over the world. So now let's think about in the United States, people in a rural area, we're getting to a college campus may be a problem and spending four years on a college campus might be a problem, but there's also an international market. There are people right now, Brazil, India in particular is a huge market for this, China as well. Uh, but there are people all over the world who want a degree and who don't have the money to go spend four years on a college campus or the resources to travel internationally and deal with all kinds of visa issues, travel issues. Um, and online education solves that. The third thing, and this might be the most important out of all of them, is a four-year college education is a great option for many, but it's not the right option for all. And so now let's think about the options that Coursera offers where somebody can study and get a certification and they study for three to six months and it'll cost them a few hundred dollars. And then they take that certification and they go to an employer that said, we will accept this certification. And they go and they say, hey, listen, we've studied for three months, six months, it cost us $600. And we are qualified to take on a job at your firm. And these companies are saying, yeah, you're absolutely qualified. And so what we're doing is lowering the barrier for people to get an employment-based education. Thank you, Harry. I think you touched on this already a little bit. What are some of the pros and cons between online learning and traditional learning that our audience should be familiar with between the traditional learning of going to universities, colleges, um, and uh, um, the associated networking opportunities, so on and so forth. Sure, and and that's a that's a phenomenal question. So, from the point of view of online, it enables lower cost. It enables people to live at home. It's great for what we the the segment of society we call alternative learners. These are people who have delayed getting a college degree for more than a year. People who need to work while they're in school. People who again maybe parents or taking care of a parent. There are all kinds of people whose circumstances don't allow for them to be on a college campus. Um, I, I also, the distance is a, a key thing. People in different countries can participate. Now, there are a lot of people who will claim, uh, and understandably so, that being on campus is an amazing experience. And having gone to the University of Michigan, it was wonderful. I loved my four years in Ann Arbor and have great feelings about that experience. Um, but that was a number of years ago. And so let's, let's talk about the reasons why people felt a need to be on a college campus, all right? That's the education model that's thousands of years old. Well, you needed access to the professors. Well, you don't need to be on the, in the lecture hall to get that access. You needed access to your fellow students to be able to discuss things, but now there are Zoom chats and there are um, chat boards where people can post their thoughts and their views and it can be asynchronous. Um, and you needed access to a research library. Well, that's no longer with the internet. You can basically get any book in a matter of seconds and at a very low cost. So there are arguments to be made for on-campus education, but increasingly those arguments are non-academic um, arguments. And th there are reasons to do it, but more, more and more of those are non-academic arguments. Now, we talked earlier about people contacting us with information. And uh, a week ago, I spoke with somebody who is a professor at three different universities. And he thought online learning during COVID was going to be a disaster. And what he found was the opposite. He actually found that by connecting with the students online, he had better relationships with them. The students knew each other better. He, they were more connected. Um, they actually had a better connection meeting online. And there are a lot of reasons for that, but I suspect part of it is when we're doing what you and I are doing right now, face-to-face, -face, you can't hide in the back of the lecture hall. There's, mm -hmm. no, there's no hanging out in the back. So everybody is in the front row. And um, according to this professor, it's working. 
So Gary, does that mean it looks like online learning is cutting through both space and time? The traditional learning is where you had to be necessarily at a particular location, at a particular time, um, in, inside the lecture hall, listening to the professor, whereas online learning, you can be sitting anywhere in the world and uh, take the course and gain an equivalent amount of knowledge. Would that be something? Yeah, that's exactly right. So what you're talking about is asynchronous learning, which is a fancy way of saying at a time that's convenient for you. So let's think about when you and I were in college right? The class was taught at a certain time. You needed to leave your dorm or your apartment 20 minutes early, yep. go walk there, get yourself in your seat. Um, and if there was going to be a discussion group with your peers to talk about it, everybody had to meet at a certain time. Um, so now let's imagine a scenario where you and I decide we're going to take an online class together. We're interested in some subject matter. Maybe it's accounting, right? We're both running businesses. We feel like we need better, you know, accounting for, uh, for startup businesses. And yep. uh, so we're going to take that class together. Well, you know, you and I tend to work very long hours. Uh, we could, if we wanted to, watch the professor's lectures at 11 at night or two in the morning mm -hmm. or midday on a Sunday. And, uh, you know, I know you and I have enough phone calls over the weekend. We're frequently working at those times. And mm -hmm there is that opportunity for us to check in and get the lecture materials um, to post, to have discussions, asynchronous discussions with our classmates. You can get on the message board and write out your view of things. And we can now do these things on our own time. And it enables us to attend to the other aspects of our lives, you know, like having a job uh, and be able to get an education at the same time. Very good. Thank you, Gary. Gary, you recommend two specific companies uh, in your report. One you already mentioned. Um, so for our audience, uh, what are the two companies? Uh, how do they differ? And what are the business models? Sure. So the two big ones that we focus on are Coursera and 2U. Um, there is a third uh, large company that serves as kind of an all- um, all-inclusive online education platform, and that's edX. edX is a uh, nonprofit joint venture that was started by Harvard and MIT, and 2U is in the process of buying them for $800 million. That transaction has been announced, but not completed as of yet. We love the deal. We think it's a great deal for 2U. Um, in terms of how they differ, that's actually really easy to explain. So to you has a reputation for very high quality and what they offer are degrees, typically um, a lot of advanced degrees. So master's doctoral degrees and uh, they tend to do so at a price that's at or around what it would cost you to learn on campus. So their big example, there was, um, they have the North Carolina MBA program, and I believe the cost for that is somewhere in the neighborhood of $120,000. So uh, 2U is dealing with a very limited number of people who are earning alternative certifications or degrees at a very high price. Coursera has gone an entirely different route. Coursera is offering tons and tons of free classes. Uh, they have 90 million registered learners on their site. And what they've successfully done is gotten people to move from uh, taking the free classes to maybe taking some paid classes or maybe a certification, or that's how they move them to the degree program. But when they go to the certifications and the degree programs, they're at sig significantly discounted prices, which is what we think is appropriate for an online model. Finally, Coursera is very focused on uh, learning for employment. So they do a lot of the certifications in conjunction with companies. They have almost 600 corporate partners. And Coursera is also working with governments. And think about all the benefits that can be provided. Think about all the people right now, tens of millions of people who are unemployed, and maybe their jobs are being replaced by automation, by computers. And so these people right now are on unemployment, um, and, and their jobs aren't coming back. 
if they can be retrained, right? If the, if the government can pay 400, 500, 600 dollars and get them retrained and off of unemployment and in a position where they are employed and paying taxes, it's good for the taxpayer, good for the government, and good for the individual who went from unemployed to employed. Coursera is enabling a lot of that. So, and they're doing it at much, much lower prices than to you. It's one of the reasons why we prefer Coursera's business model. Got it. Um, and Gary, I think you shed some additional light in your report in terms of the revenue per user per year or per quarter from Coursera. It looks like Coursera has a very large audience and it offers its uh, courses at a fraction of, of the cost they would otherwise pay uh, to, uh, in traditional methods. And whereas 2U is a little more concentrated, they have a, like a different mo business model, their revenue per user is a lot higher. Uh, can you shed some light on that, those aspects, uh, comparison between these two companies? Sure. To you, um, right now, pre the edX acquisition has about 15 million registered learners. And the people who are taking classes are paying prices that are comparable to on-campus prices. Um, Coursera, 90 million, and you have people taking classes at significantly discounted prices. Um, so these are, you know, these are core differences in their business models. Um, we give to you credit, they are uh, EBITDA positive now, but we actually like what Coursera is doing. They will tell you on every conference call that they're doing what Amazon did 20 years ago. They're saying, we will spend every dollar in trying to build the business. And what we've seen time and time again in the online space, in the online platform space, there are huge advantages to being the first one to get to scale. And that's what Coursera is going for. And the number that we look at that supports Coursera's point that their model works is their cost to acquire additional revenue is significantly lower than it is for 2U. Um, 2U is paying a lot more in marketing because they're running call centers saying, hey, listen, you're not on campus. Do you wanna pay the same amount to get a degree? And they're succeeding at it, but it's very expensive to do. Whereas Coursera is getting people to sign up for free classes and then they move their way up to a degree program. It's, as we've said before, um, a business model that's working in multiple ways with lots of different people and it's less fragile. So we prefer Coursera's model. And Gary, you mentioned it very briefly in your previous answer. Um, and something that caught my attention in the report as well, the comparison to Amazon 20 years ago and how Amazon disrupted the retail industry. Can you shed light on the comparison and how you think EdTech and particularly firms like Coursera and to, to you are disrupting the education space? So let's, let's talk about that last part first. Um, we don't know, we, I, I wouldn't say that uh, these platforms are disrupting the education space, we actually think they're partnering with the universities. And that is one area where this is very different from what Amazon did. So 20 years ago, Amazon took aim at the retail industry and completely decimated huge parts of it. And what we've seen are lots and lots of stores closing. And a couple of years ago, there were dozens and dozens of retail companies that declared bankruptcy. A lot of that is because shopping moved online. Coursera and 2U are doing the opposite. They're partnering with universities. These are huge value add propositions because the universities can still run their on-campus model and then add um, the online version on top of that. One of the great examples we can give you, Kieran, is last week we spoke with somebody who is, uh, or was, sorry, an administrator and a professor at two different universities. When she worked with Coursera, Coursera got 50,000 people taking her class. This is wow. hugely additive for a university. Um, but going back to your original question, which is how does this compare to Amazon? To us, we look at Amazon 20 years ago and we see two things. One, they looked at a business model that was inconvenient for the consumer. You had to drive to a mall. It was gonna take you a couple of hours. You had to drive there, park, walk in, deal with somebody. Um, you had to do it during their business hours. If you got caught in traffic, the store might close while you were on your way there. Um, and then the, that business model is expensive. Retail space is expensive space, especially in class A malls. You have to staff 
those uh, stores, you have a ton of people um, who are designing displays. I mean, the whole thing costs you a fortune. And what Amazon did was they said, you know what, our real estate is going to be inexpensive warehouse space outside of city centers. We're going to staff it with people who can pack dozens and dozens of boxes an hour. We're going to lower costs and tell the customer, you shop whenever you want. You can shop at two, three in the morning. We'll deliver to you. You don't have to drive to the mall. Well, we see Coursera doing the same kind of thing right now. They're making education available at a very low cost. They're going to where people are. You don't have to go beyond a college campus. And from the point of view of a university, um, maintaining that physical infrastructure, all of those buildings is very, very expensive. Well, if you have 50,000 people taking your class online, that, uh, that'll cut a hole in your maintenance budget and your administrative budget. So uh, we do see the similarity um, with Amazon that this is a business that could grow an enormous amount over the next 5, 10, 20 years. The place that it's different is they're partnering with the universities instead of destroying them. Perfect. I think so. So the key here is looks like both Coursera and to, um, to you are platform technology companies where they are actually partnering, bringing education, making it more accessible and bringing additional revenue to the university. So they're not trying to disrupt the traditional learning model. They're just making it more accessible to a more wider audience. Would that be accurate? That's exactly right. And Kieran, think about this. In five years, we're gonna be talking about Telk the same way. The way Telk is a platform that partners with independent research providers, you're not competitors, you're partners to these people and you're bringing um, companies like Deep Knowledge Investing and other high quality independent research providers, more revenue, a chance to connect with more people, yeah. right? So in five years, yeah. it'll, it'll be, you know, first there was Amazon, then Coursera, and then we'll be talking about how Telk has completely disrupted the space. Um, as they say, Gary, your word is not to be. So, so my next question is more specific to how would you structure your investments in these companies? And between Coursera and to you, do you have a specific preference in terms of and why? Uh, Definitely Coursera. Um, and we acknowledge that Coursera is much more expensive, but as we've talked about, it's a less fragile business model, and we think they're in the right direction. Charging people a few hundred dollars where you can get them certified and they can go get a job in three to six months, that's a great place to be. Enabling people in India to get a degree from a top U U.S. university without having to deal with immigration visas or the expense, that's a great place to be. Um, to you is succeeding at getting um, people to pay full price for online education, but I suspect that that's not going to be a sustainable model, and we think that's more fragile. In terms of structuring, we offer people a number of options. Now, our preference is just to own Coursera, and we don't worry so much about the entry point. We think this is a business that can grow the top line 30% or more for the next five or 10 years. And if that happens, you just wanna own this. You just wanna own the stock. And uh, you will have to deal with a certain amount of short-term volatility. That to us isn't important. We see this as a long-term holding. Um, but for some portfolio managers, they have concentration limits. They can't take a huge position in Coursera. If you need to cover more ground, you could own some Coursera and some to you. Um, it's not our preference, but it would suit some people's risk controls better. Um, it, we are also seeing an increase in inflation in the United States. Interest rates are at uh, insanely low levels right now. At some point, the Fed is going to have to raise rates. When they do that, high multiple tech companies tend not to perform so well. We're prepared to manage through that volatility, but for people who are worried about that, uh, you could always... Um, sell out of the money put options and effectively either grab the premium for free or be buying Coursera at a discount. That's not a bad option for people. And then the final option, we don't like this one, but we pointed out um, is you can buy Coursera and you could hedge by shorting uh, the NASDAQ, shorting the QQQ, um, shorting the TLT, the 10-year the treasury. 
Uh, we would just point out that a large number of really smart people have gotten crushed in that particular trade this yeah. year. Not so much because of Coursera, but the market is done when it's done. Um, it's not a perfect hedge. We're just offering people a lot of different ways to think about the same thing. Thank you, Gary. Uh, I think my next question was related to risk factors, but I think you already touched on some of the risk factors that uh, investors should be aware of. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna take two questions from the chat. One is uh, a comparison that some that we pointed out earlier. Mm -hmm. Traditional education gives access to professors and networking opportunities more so in a business school setting, uh, including the case study method and the opportunity to form a bonding with your classmates. How does online education address this? Yeah, we, we love that question. Um, and so we would we'd point to two different things here. One, the example that we talked about earlier in this call where we had a professor who said, my relationships with my students are even better. Again, no one can sit in the back of the classroom. But more importantly, Kieran, the thing that no one notices is he's a professor at three different universities. How does that happen? It's because it's online. He got a phone call from a university located five states away that said, can you teach a class in two weeks? He put together a syllabus and was effectively on campus, even though he was at home. So previously, in order to get a professor to teach at your school, you, you had to call that person, have them come take a recruiting trip. You had to convince them to move themselves, their family, and then you hope that you had a good fit because it's a disaster if you start to build a program around someone and they leave after a year or two. Now, universities can curate their professors and you can get the best professors from all over the world. Um, the second thing that we'd point out is uh, Eric's question is really interesting because it deals with bonding with classmates. And there is a perception that being in person is better. Um, one of the people on the board of advisors of Deep Knowledge Investing is John Krubsky of the Institute for Applied Decisional Sciences, which is a phenomenal name. Um, but he's done a ton of work on this. And it actually turns out that meeting with people over Zoom connecting just like we are now actually forms a deeper connection. Now, part of that is because you can't be distracted, right? You are focused on the camera, on the screen. There's no, there's no other place to look. And if you do, it's very obvious. The other thing is we're meeting instead of out in a public place, we're meeting in our own personal intimate places, right? You're in your home, I'm in my home. And something about that helps people take the walls down and, um, and allows them to connect in a better way. And so some of this is counterintuitive, but it is working. Thanks, Gary. Um, last question. Uh, it's actually a very interesting one. Uh, this is from Jennifer, and she's asking, what about cheating on these online courses? Uh, traditional learning, you go to a classroom, you have a proctor, you take the test with everyone else. Um, and the scope for cheating is very less, but how does online learning where can if someone else uh, could take the test and stuff you, what about the learning value uh, and you still get a certificate or something? Uh, so sure. how does that address? Yeah. Well, let, let's point out the obvious. Cheating has existed before the internet did, right? And I, I, will, I, I can't prove it, but I will bet you anything that if we could go back to ancient Greece, somebody in Socrates class right, looked at, at the tablet of the guy next to him, right? So, somebody there, the dishonesty, cheating, people who don't value doing their own work, their own education, that's existed since the beginning of human society. The internet did not create uh, dishonesty. So this is not a unique problem for online education. Um, we would point out, and we've spoken to Coursera about this, there are ways, there is technology. So there is anti-cheating technology, anti-plagiarism technology. They can track eye movements, they can track speed of responses, they can see if the responses match other responses that have been given. Um, you know, the funniest example we, we heard of was somebody um, pretended to sneeze or drop something and you know they ducked down out of the frame and somebody <laughs> else came up to take the exam and hoped like the proctor wouldn't notice it. Um, I, look, there are always ways to, to defeat um, 
being honest. And we all know of people in high school who wrote answers on their hands or wrote little cheat sheets. And then after that, there were the, the programmable calculators where people could program in the answers. This is an issue everywhere and anywhere. There is good technology available, but there's no way they're going to catch everybody. Um, but ultimately, if you pretend and you go get a job based on uh, your credentials and you didn't bother to study and don't know what you're doing, and this stuff should sort itself out pretty quickly. Thank you, Gary. I think in the interest of time, any concluding remarks on the opportunity or particular stocks or anything that was probably not covered in, in the set of questions? Yeah, thank, thanks for that, Kieran. So we view this as a phenomenal opportunity for easily the next five, 10 years. Um, but the one thing that I promise everybody listening to this is the technology is going to move fast. So if you look at online education right now, I guarantee you that two years from now, it will look different. Five years from now, it will look different again. This is something that's going to require regular maintenance. It's something that we're going to be following for a long time. We are still, even though we came out with a 20 plus page report a couple of weeks ago, we're still talking to administrators, university presidents, people who run these platforms, people who advertise for these platforms, people who market for them, um, professors. We're still going to be covering this space um, for people who want to be following this closely and have capital committed. Please feel free to reach out to us at ir at deepknowledgeinvesting.com. Uh, and for people who like um, the idea of connecting with independent research providers, uh, get in touch with Kieran at Telk. There are other good people on the platform, um, but we'd love to hear from people who want to be following this for a long time because we don't take everything that we have and put it out in public. There are certain aspects to this that we save for our subscribers. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, everyone, for joining. If you have any qu further questions or need further information, you can always reach out or LinkedIn, other channels uh, to Gary or myself. Uh, we will send you a link to the recording as well. Um, and we may actually do a follow up to the segment in a few weeks time uh, with uh, more updated information. Thank you, Gary. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure having you. Terrific. Kieran, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it.